Hey there, and welcome to your brain. It's built from billions of neurons, all sending small electric spikes to each other, working together to produce you. So what exactly are these spikes? In this video, we'll take a look at what they look like, what makes them appear, and how they move through the neurons. And we'll include a little bonus trick that vertebrates, like you, used to speed up these spikes. A little heads up, there is no way to introduce this material without relying a bit on physics and chemistry, so to make up for it, we'll try to make it a little more fun. First, let's do a quick review of the neuron. So here it is. It has a number of dendrites, they're typically the inputs, and an axon, that's typically the output. The dendrites usually don't stick out too far, but the axon can grow really long. So what is a spike in a neuron? Let's make one appear and see what happens. To do that, we'll need to connect a few other neurons to this neuron and have them send a signal. At the points where the neurons touch, let's have the upstream neurons squirt some chemicals, called neurotransmitters, at our neuron. That will create bits of current in the dendrites that flows to the main cell and to the axon. If these currents are not strong enough, that's where it ends. But if they are strong enough, that is the spike, also called an action potential. And it's more than just a little bit of current. Neurons are a lot less friendly to electric currents than insulated copper wires, and despite that, the spike can travel down surprisingly long accents while maintaining uniform strength. So there is something else going on here. But before we get there, Let's see what the spike looks like close up. So here's the axon. Let's stick in an electrode right there. <coughs> Scientists have actually done this, by the way. And put another electrode outside and measure the difference in voltage. If nothing else is going on, no spike, just steady state, we'll find that the inside of the neuron is negatively charged compared to the outside by about minus 75 millivolts to minus 40 millivolts. Now, Suppose a spike comes by this way. If we measure what happens to the voltage, it will first start out low, then quickly rise, then decline a bit slower, overshooting the bottom slightly, and then it will level off where it started. And the whole thing will happen in milliseconds. That is what the spike looks like. And if we zoom out a bit, so that the bottom axis of the graph shows seconds instead of milliseconds, we'll see why it's called a spike. And now we are ready to see what exactly is going on, but to do that, we'll need to go one level deeper. It turns out that in the fluid inside and outside the cell, there are a lot of ions, little charged particles. There are potassium ions, sodium ions, chlorine ions, calcium ions, and others. Neurons don't like sodium, so they try to pump it out. And they like potassium, so they try to pump it in. And they also don't like chlorine and calcium. The ions, though, aren't happy with being concentrated like that, and so some of them leak back, either back into the cell or back out of the cell. All these particles carry an electric charge, either positive or negative, and on the whole, the neurons pump out more charge than they pump in. So inside the cell becomes more negatively charged than the outside, specifically by minus 75 to minus 40 millivolts. Alright, so this gives us our initial negative resting charge. So what makes the spike happen? The ion channels. Neuron cell membrane has ion channels that can open to let some ions in, and then close. Most let through only a specific ion, like this one lets through only sodium, and this one potassium. There are other channels for calcium, chlorine, and there are some that let any ions through. And then, some ion channels open when certain chemicals bind to them like neurotransmitters, and others open when the voltage inside the cell rises. These are called voltage-gated because they are opened by increase in voltage, and they are the ones that make the spike happen. So let's see how voltage-gated sodium and potassium channels work together to make a spike. Let's start out with everything at rest. Ion channels are closed, the voltage is at resting potential, and all the ions are on the appropriate sides of the cell membrane. Now suppose something raises the voltage a bit, like incoming current from the dendrites. 
that increase in voltage is enough to make the sodium channels open and the sodium ions start to rush in. Sodium ions carry a positive charge, so inside the neuron the total charge in the voltage increases. At the same time the increase in voltage opens the potassium channels, but they open slowly, so it doesn't make much difference at first. The sodium channels open only for a short time and then they quickly close. At the same time the current builds up in the potassium channels. Potassium also carries a positive charge. So inside the neuron the total charge and the voltage drops and overshoots. Eventually the potassium channels close and everything levels off. And then the channels take some time to reset and get ready for the next spike. So let's review quickly. The initial spike happens because positively charged sodium ions rush in, and then the voltage drops back down because positively charged potassium ions rush out. And if we zoom out a bit, we'll see how the spike moves along the axon. When these ion channels open, voltage here increases. That increase in voltage creates some electric current, which pushes some positively charged ions there and the voltage there increases a bit too. That triggers these channels to open, and then these channels in turn let in more ions, increase the voltage, create the current, and open these channels, and so on, and so on. And that's how the spike moves down the axon. But hold on, what stops the spike from moving backwards? As the spike is moving along, yes, these channels create some electric current that flows forward, but wouldn't they also create some backward current? Well, yes, the current from the spike does flow back through the main cell body and into the dendrites, where it can be an important input into the calculations that the dendrites perform. But the channels take some time to reset after each opening, so these channels stay closed and so the spike keeps moving in one direction. All right, we just saw two channels in action. A channel that creates a transient sodium current that opens fast and closes fast, and a channel that creates a potassium current that opens and closes slowly. There are many other channels creating different kinds of currents, like a sodium channel that opens slowly and doesn't close, a calcium channel that's triggered when voltage gets really high, and that creates a long-lasting current, a channel that opens when the voltage gets too low, and when it opens, allows a slow trickle of sodium and potassium ions. And there are dozens of other ion channels known to us, and probably more that we don't know about. And different combinations of these ion channels can produce different spiking patterns. Like in this pyramidal neuron from the cortex, or in this relay neuron from thalamus, or pacemaker neurons from various systems. All right, that's cool. So how quickly do the spikes move through neurons? Well, that's where we run into a bit of a problem. Specifically, the ion channels cannot be too far apart or they cannot trigger each other. To see why, let's say that you increase voltage here by sticking in some positive charge then a lot of other positively charged ions will get shoved down the axon, increasing the voltage there. But not as much as we'd like. That's because many of the ions will leak out of the cell along the way. And many of the remaining ones will attract some negatively charged ions on the other side of the cell membrane, indirectly leaking out even more current through an effect called capacitance. In fact, Studies show that over about half a millimeter of a neuron, the voltage from a spike can drop from one end to the other by as much as 10 times depending on the neuron configuration. So for the ion channels to be able to trigger each other, they have to be spaced closer together. This means that to send a signal over a long distance, you'd have to wait for a lot of ion channels to be opened and closed along the way. That's not great if you are trying to send a signal from one side of the brain to the other. To deal with that, vertebrates, that is all animals with a spine, including humans, use a special bonus trick that I mentioned in the intro. They wrap insulation around their accents using myelin. 
Myelin forms in segments along neurons with long-running axons. In these segments, the ions have harder time leaking out, and more of them reach the other end. That means that the ion channels can now be spaced farther apart, in the bare axon segments between myelin sheaths. And we can reduce the number of ion channels that have to be triggered. That results in a lot of speedup. Spikes travel through axons without myelin at a few meters per second, up to 10 in most extreme cases. But in myelinated axons, signals can travel over 100 meters per second. Not every neuron uses myelin though, just the ones that have long axons. So that's it! Spikes happen because ion channels open, let in some ions, and change the voltage. And spikes move through neurons because this change in voltage triggers more channels to open, which again changes the voltage, triggers the next set of channels, and so on, and so on. And myelin helps the spikes move quickly over long distances. That's it! Actually, that's not quite it. Neurotransmitters do a lot more than just start spikes. And we only hinted at how dendrites perform calculations. But these are stories for other videos.